What's up, Droners? B here from Droner Tech, brought to you by RemotePilot101.com. And you know what it is, the monthly Droner news. Let's get into it. All right, so the first story is a very interesting story because if you go in our way back machine to some earlier Droner news, I actually talked about in January of uh, December of 2019 about how there are some drones flying over Nebraska, some parts of western Nebraska, and over Colorado at night that are, are pretty much like aliens. Nobody knows what they are. They're huge. They come in swarms. They disappear. Nobody knows what's going on. And so that has aroused a lot of curiosity to the point where it's just like, yo, it might be time to get some like federal officials up in here. Let's let us figure out what is going on with this because the size of these drones are too big and there's too many and there's too many too well coordinated for this to be kosher. Is the I mean it's just like everybody's like what is this? And nobody knows. The police there didn't know. So they're like let's bring in the big guns and let's figure it out. They circled their wagons, they talked to government agencies, they did all the things, talked to the FAA and guess what they found? Nothing. They didn't find out anything about these guys. All they know is that the airspace they're flying in is clear to fly. They're flying at night, which means that they have to have their night waiver, but they can't prove or disprove that they didn't or didn't, did or didn't have that because they don't know who they are and they have harmed no one. That is what they know. All we know, the only thing that we know for sure is there's only one document about this entire experience that has not been uh, released by the FAA, and we don't even know why it hasn't. But that could just be the FAA saying that they have some advanced form of monitoring the different UASs in the air that we're not supposed to know about, so they just can't release it. And even that monitoring system failed, or maybe it did show that they were there, but that doesn't tell them who it is. They have no idea who it is, and it is absolutely hilarious to me in theory. But this also brings up a lot of concerns and questions. You know, at, at the moment, there is a, a very, very, very serious debate going on about the remote ID laws and saying that drones should have license plates on all of them so that we can identify who they are. And when we say license plates, we're thinking license plates like a car, where it's like, yeah, you can see what it says on the license plate, but that doesn't tell you what my name is or what my address is. Only law enforcement officials are going to be able to tell you who that person is or where they live. And that's the kind of idea behind drone license, drone ID, the, the idea that I like at least behind drone ID or remote ID laws that are most likely going to be implemented in some way, shape, or form in the near future. So proponents of that kind of legislation are like screaming about this and saying this has to happen. And then obviously there's another side saying, hey, they're in G airspace. They're in G airspace. They may or may not probably have a nighttime waiver. Uh, yeah, they are swarms of drones, but we also don't know how many people are flying it. We cannot prove that anything illegal has happened here specifically. It's a slippery slope because there is a way that they can be doing all the things they're doing legally if they have their night waivers and they do have a drone pilot for each one of those drones even though it's in a swarm. It's not illegal to fly a drone in a swarm. It is, unless you get the right type of waiver like the Intel people did or like what's going on like Intel did with Disney, you gotta have a specific, pla you have to have like a very, very specific instructions to be able to fly like that and it's very, very difficult. But if they do that, or they have somebody flying each one of those drones and they have the night waiver, they're good to go. So this is a really weird story of just people just like like riding the edge of what's, what's legal and also just like kind of messing with everybody. <laughs> they just show up and do what they want and then disappear and nobody knows who did it. I absolutely love it. All right, up next, we have artificial intelligence tech that is helping indoor swarms of drones stay safe and fly. Now this is really interesting. When you think about a swarm of drones, you know that normally this is a hive mentality in the sense of you have a one big brain that's controlling all the drones remotely at once. And obviously that's a lot of computing power that has to happen with that one, which could limit how many of those drones you could have in the air because they're all technically dumb drones that are all flying from that. Now this type of algorithm, the AI, is actually giving each and every single one of these drones their own computing power and the ability to be able to make decisions in the air, sense the things around them as well as the other drones. So they can sense the environment, they can sense other drones, and that allows them to be able to do more complex maneuvers and be able to do more coordinated things that maybe the big brain model can't do. Now what's important about this technology? Well, besides us being able to expand the ability for these drones to be able to do more bigger things on a bigger scale, also this same exact technology is being looked to use, be used in AI or self-driving cars. This is pretty cool, I think, um, because I know that one of the biggest challenges when you're looking at like what the Intel did, the Intel 500 and all that, is the a lot of it was really, I shouldn't say easy, but it's a lot easier that they did a lot of those flights outdoors because the radio transmissions and the GPS and everything is very, very easy to have when you're outdoors, especially when you don't have all these radio frequencies. But when you get indoors, 
the GPS becomes exponentially more difficult. You might not have any GPS. So having the drones have the ability to, to see and feel, or I should say, sense the things around them and be able to also make decisions based upon what they're sensing around them makes things so much easier and allows the technology of what we can do indoors with drones, it just, it changes things. And I'm really excited to see how this gets applied, obviously to drone cinematography, but also to like the industry. And when you're looking at like enterprise type drones that are doing the surveying and things like that, it's like, will this be helpful for them and say, hey, just deploy the swarm inside, inside of the Hoover Dam and go like look, at, look for all the cracks or something. I don't know. This could be something that, you know, could really help advance that type of technology that could help us be a lot more efficient at the big project scales that we do. Big scale project. However you word that, like that. Up next, possible interference with GPS, GPS signals for drones. Let's, let's take it back. This is how this story starts. Back in April 2020, the FCC granted a license uh, for transmitters on their 5G networks that would operate on the L-band network. Now, the L-band network is a, close, is a network that is actually right next to the same frequency that GPS is on. And there's been some concerns raised about these types of networks interfering with drones. And what they were actually able to find after studying it is that a regular drone, like a DJI drone, does have GPS interference when they are within 0.6 miles of any of these transmitters. And then even the bigger drones, like Enterprise drones, like Matrices, the ones that are more sensitive to that, can have interference issues up to two miles away from them, which is a very, very big deal. And it became a bigger deal in the UK where a Matrice 600 Pro was being used to do surveying and like lost GPS, lost everything, and then crashed into a house, which if you don't know how big an M600 is, it's like this. It is a hexacopter that is absolutely huge and terrifying. I actually was flying one last week. If that was to crash into me or any of the things that I have around me, it's definitely gonna cause damage to whatever it hits because it's a terrifying drone when it comes to the danger that it comes from it. And they even put up a secondary drone to be able to find the first drone and experience the same exact issues but were able to land that one safely. Now this is something that really, I personally believe is a very, 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 very big deal because Maybe there's another way that we can do this 5G thing without being on this L-band network because if they start putting those towers that have that everywhere, then it's gonna make flying a drone extremely difficult. They're gonna have to figure out a different way for us to either connect to GPS or not use GPS at all. Uh, Cause having that GPS go away like that um, and not having a, a, a switch to possibly go into what used to be called that G, uh, DJI drones don't do anymore for the most part, Addy mode, where you're not flying with GPS, so you can actually just fly the dumb drone that's not connected to GPS anymore. If you don't have that on your drone and you're fully reliant on GPS, which a lot of the new drones are, then this could become extremely dangerous. And I think it's something that we should definitely be keeping our eyes on as well as keeping uh, our voices heard in the legislation that happens around these types of towers and transmitters. Up next, Skydio. As you guys may or may not know, the Scadio 2, my last month, last month's uh, Journal News, I talked about the Scadio 2 and how it's actually more available. And I also talked about how Parrot just released an enterprise type drone for military purposes that, you know, pretty much allows them to compete with DJI because DJI actually cannot compete in that space because of those governmental contracts. Because that was so petty and how they did it, I, first of all, thought it was hilarious how petty they were, directly jabbing at DJI for being a Chinese company, even though they were a French company, but that's neither here nor there. Skydio is a, a straight up red, white, and blue company, all American, all the way through, as far as we can tell. And they are actually doing the same thing. They're going to release a patriotic drone themselves that is going to be an enterprise, one for enterprise, and one for military use. And they didn't give us the prices on it yet, but I mean, even if we just look at what Parrot's doing, like their regular Parrot drone is like, you know, under $2,000, and this one was like six or $7,000. I imagine that this one's probably gonna be expensive as well, but it's also probably gonna have a lot of really cool capabilities. It's gonna be a folding drone. It's gonna be able to do GPS fly, uh, powered night flight, and it has a full blown like enterprise controller that has a touch screen, precision steering, and all the fun stuff. Literally 35 minute flight time, which for some reason, everybody likes to claim 35 minute flight time. I still haven't seen it personally. The most I've ever seen is like 29 minutes, but you know, in the right conditions, whatever, maybe it happens. And also something I found really interesting is like up to a hundred times zoom. Now is that optical or digital zoom? I'm not sure. I'm assuming it's a combination of the two, but either way, that's the most zoom I've ever heard of being on a drone, a drone, a drone camera. And they're gonna have 3D, scan, uh, 3D scanning features, which you know most drones could do that anyway if you connect it to the right app. But it sounds like it's gonna have an internal ability, uh, ability to do that. So it's due out for later this year, and they're really hoping it can make an impact because, you know, 
they going you know, after DJI has been decimating the, the entire industry, it'd be really good for them to be able to get that competitive footing in something like enterprise and military drones, which for me means that hopefully they'll have the money to be able to do more research and development, to be able to develop more consumer drones, so we can have better drones to compete against DJI. Now, obviously, most of my drone fleet is DJI drones, but I've been saying this for literal years, is that yes, they're fantastic, but they need competitors to be better, to be more, like, or have our pricing be better, as well as to advance the technology in a way that is just gonna work for us, not against us. All right, and last but not least, there is a company called Flying Pictures, which is hilarious because my company's name is Transit Pictures, so there's just a weird vibe there. But Flying Pictures developed what they're calling the world's most powerful drone. And you know, I'm not gonna argue with some of this because I mean, by world's most powerful, like I, I, I feel like they should say like camera drone, maybe? Because I don't really feel like this is messing with like the Predator drones or anything like that because they're technically drones too and I don't think those even compare. I feel like the Predator would absolutely destroy this, but that's neither here nor there. This drone is pretty powerful when it comes to camera work, and they are literally aiming at having the biggest and heaviest camera packages being able to be carried on this drone. We're talking about like the Alexa RE like film camera with the giant lens on it, like 130 pound payload, like that big. They're talking about doing it, and they're not, honestly, they're not talking about it. They did it, you can see it. On their site, they have videos of this drone flying that camera, like 130 pounds. And it's a really versatile drone as well because the heavier camera is like, the, like I said, the one I just said, the film camera flies on top of the drone. But then they have like the smaller build outs, they fly below the drone. That's just insane, 130 pounds. I just love to know what kind of licensing they need to be able to fly that because all the FAA laws say that 55 pounds and higher as the entire package is not a part of UAS operations. So the part 107 does not apply. So these people are either getting pilot's licenses or whatever else, because I honestly don't know what happens when you get above 55 pounds. Do you guys know? If you do, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, this thing is, is flying at around 65 miles an hour, which is crazy to think you have an 130 pound payload, payload on a drone going that fast. And obviously, if you're gonna be flying these, these cameras, these are extremely expensive cameras, you gotta have redundancy. And so the redundancy we're looking at here is they have full motor and power redundancy. They have eight, it's a, a octocopter, but they're all doubled up. So it's the ones that are like bloop, bloop, like one on top of the other. So if one of those motors, rotors goes down, it'll still be able to land safely. The battery redundancy, obviously enough batteries in a, in a series that if any of them have fail, then it still probably give them a signal and be able to come back and, and land. Dual redundant controllers, that's a big deal. And then this one's my favorite, triple ballistic parachute system. I don't know what a triple ballistic system means, but I do know what a parachute system is. I assume that means there's three of them that shoot out. I'm just, I, I don't use ballistic parachutes with my drones, so I mean, I'm, I'm not on this level. But either way, this drone is obviously the most powerful camera drone I've ever seen before, and I found it to be really interesting. If they're able to do this safely on this type of platform, maybe they're kind of sort of setting the standard of other things that could come. I'm not personally interested. Some people obviously may be. Certain directors of photography are just like, yo, this is where it's at. For me, I'm just, I'm gonna stick with my Inspire 2, and if something's bigger than maybe an Alta 6 or an 8 or a Matrice to be able to do the big heavy lift, and that's about as high as I'm gonna go. Droners, thank you so much for checking out this month's Droner News. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And remember, it was brought to you by remotepilot101.com. And as always, I want you guys to make sure you subscribe and stay fly.